How does faster than light travel actually work in Mass Effect? Greetings spacefarers, I'm Michael and welcome to MTJ Disorder's Mass Effect lore, a passion piece on all things Mass Effect. If you are a fan of science fiction, gaming and other action adventure related media, then feel free to like this video and subscribe for more. In a recent video, I broke down the history and design of the most commonly seen Alliance cruisers in the Mass Effect series, and in true MTJ Disorder fashion, I made an epic gaffe, referring to the Ezo Drive Core as both a ship's power source and its primary means of faster than light propulsion. In reality, the Drive Core is only one component of a far more complex system that makes FDL travel possible. So credit where it's due, thanks to this brave viewer who called me out on that one. I figured the best way to clear things up is with a video of its own. An exploration into the actual mechanics behind how starships achieve faster than light travel in the Mass Effect universe. Let's begin by addressing the first mistake. Starships in Mass Effect, just like present day Navy vessels, are in fact powered by fusion reactors. They are the only things keeping the lights on, that and most likely a series of auxiliary power units and batteries. Presumably everything on board, from computers to weapon systems and yes, the engines themselves, would not be able to operate without the power generated by these reactors. The second mistake was suggesting the Ezo core itself provides a means of propulsion, and while I will die on the hill that the Ezo core is a component of what makes the ship move, it simply does not provide any means of thrust. The only way a ship like the Berlin or York class can achieve thrust is from conventional engines such as fusion torches and anti-proton drives. And lastly, the Ezo core doesn't just provide the means in which a ship can achieve FTL, it is also responsible for generating the mass effect fields for all applications on board, such as inertial compensators, artificial gravity and kinetic barriers. So how do ships in Mass Effect achieve faster than light travel? Like other sci-fi franchises such as Star Trek and The Expanse, Mass Effect attempts to use plot devices to eliminate potential hurdles of special relativity rather than straight up ignoring them. There are two primary forms of FTL we see used in the games. The first and most important, used by all spacefaring species participating in galactic civilization, is the Mass Relay Network. Believed to be technology left behind by the enigmatic Protheans, Mass Relays are in fact a system of control control utilised by the Reapers to ensure galactic civilization develops along predetermined paths. There isn't a lot of information on how they work, and in fact, the closest any species came to successfully reverse engineering the technology was the Protheans on Ilos. Scattered across the stars, these towering constructs form a network that spans the entire Milky Way galaxy. When activated, a relay creates a corridor of virtually mass-free space, allowing ships to cross unimaginable distances, journeys that would take centuries using conventional FTL drives in mere moments. There are two main types of relays, primary and secondary. Primary relays are the most powerful, capable of slinging ships thousands of light years, often from one spiral arm of the galaxy to another. There is a catch, however. Each primary relay is locked to a single destination, a one-to-one -one connection with its twin in a corresponding star cluster. If one end is lost or inactive, its partner will also remain dormant. Secondary relays, on the other hand, offer more flexibility. They can only bridge a few hundred light years, but are omnidirectional, capable of sending ships to any other relay within their local range. They are the closest thing to magic in Mass Effect, somehow bridging two points in space that, while still within the same observable light cone, are so distant from one another that they exist in entirely different regions of space-time. My personal theory on how this works is through a combination of quantum entanglement and massive computers that both store quantum data and spatial coordinates of all vessels passing through the relay. This way continuity can be maintained from the perspective of all observers, almost as if the relay not only sends ships across distance but also time, allowing travellers to move back and forth between locations within the Milky Way without any time dilation. It's mind-numbing stuff that I can't even begin to comprehend, but the way I see it is when you enter a relay you are leaving the space-time behind you and arriving in the past on the other side, so that there is a virtual present maintained between all locations traversable within the network. It requires a little suspension of disbelief, but then again it is science fiction. What is your crazy theory on how it works? Let me know in the comments. 
The second form of FTL and the mode in which all spacefaring civilizations will initially embark upon is the conventional approach achieved for individual ships from the combination of sublight thrust and the activation of mass effect fields. Though the principle is very much the same as relay travel, it is significantly less advanced and subject to far more limitations of real world physics, making it feel more realistic. Which is appropriate in the context of the mass effect universe. FTL drive cores are a feat of civil engineering, mass relays are incomprehensible cattle prods. As mentioned in my correction of the previous mistake made in the last video, the drive cores are nothing more than devices that are part of a more complex system that when working in unison will result in faster than light speeds. They work by exposing element zero to electrical currents, creating a field that reduces a ship's effective mass. With this reduction, a vessel can use conventional thrusters to reach speeds far beyond light without warping spacetime or causing time dilation. A simplistic way of visualizing this is with a modern day automobile. The more people inside the vehicle, the slower it accelerates. Remove some of those people, i.e. the mass, and the same amount of gas will result in a higher burst of speed. At cruising speed, an average ship can cover around a dozen light years in a single day, though this is highly dependent on both the ship's size and the size of its drive core. These FTL drives are built with strict safety protocols, preventing activation if a significant object lies in the flight path, a failsafe dating back to Prothean design principles. Disabling it is nearly impossible, though a few rare cases, such as the Valum Blast on Tetris, have shown that ancient jury-rigged plotters can bypass it. That kind of modification, however, takes both a particle physicist's brain and a mechanic's hands, so it's highly unlikely. As mentioned, a ship's FTL speed and endurance depend on the size of its drive. For instance, larger cores can maintain FTL for longer periods. And no matter how advanced the system, basic physics still applies. Ships accelerate for half their journey, then reverse thrust for the other half to slow down before arrival, a detail many travelers tend to forget. There are a few drawbacks to this method of FTL, most notably the long travel times between star clusters. Civilizations relying solely on this method would be limited, very much like the Andromeda initiative in the Helios cluster. Navigation is also quite tricky, not only requiring a thorough knowledge of established travel lanes, but an onboard dedicated navigator and virtual intelligence to help plot and calculate emergency routes. Then there's the issue of maintaining mass effect fields. During extended faster than light travel, element zero drive cores build up a static electrical charge that increases the longer a ship remains in FTL. Eventually, this energy must be safely released. Large vessels can discharge it into a planet's magnetic field, while smaller craft can vent it through direct surface contact. Meanwhile, space stations without nearby planets like the Citadel are equipped with special discharge facilities to handle the buildup. If this charge isn't released, it will eventually arc through the ship itself, superheating the hull, melting bulkheads, frying electronics and killing everyone on board. Likewise, if for any reason reason whatsoever the drive core fails during transit, this will also be catastrophic. With the resulting snap back to sublight speeds, the ship and all those aboard will not survive. There are some noteworthy observable effects that take place when ships are travelling within these fields. When a ship enters FTL, light behaves differently inside. Just as light bends when passing through glass, it refracts when crossing into the field, causing objects outside to distort and split into shifting colours. As the ship's subjective speed of light increases, nearby stars appear to redshift, fading into radio and gamma radiation, until only the brightest pulsars and quasars remain visible. From the outside, however, a vessel in FTL appears blue-shifted, its emissions climbing into higher energy spectrums. These distortions make ships at FTL visible across vast distances, though their signal still travels at light speed. It's also why stealth systems like the Normandies can't function during FTL. The ship's heat and emissions are shifted far beyond what its sinks can absorb. The exact speeds of FTL travel in Mass Effect aren't precisely defined, but here are some estimates I found in codex entries and other resources. The Reapers are by far the fastest known constructed objects, believed to reach nearly 30 light years per day, roughly 11,000 times the speed of light, which is about twice as fast as most typical Citadel starships. By 2165, human vessels could reach around 50 times light speed, covering 0.14 light years in 24 hours. Respectable, but still nowhere near Reaper efficiency. Centuries later, the Andromeda Initiative's arcs cross 2.5 million light years in 634 years, averaging about 3,900 times light speed, while the Tempest could manage around 13 light years per day. 
Even with these advancements, such speeds are still incomprehensible, keeping our understanding of FTL in Mass Effect one part science and one part mystery. Faster than light travel remains one of the most awe-inspiring achievements of the Mass Effect universe, a blend of science, mystery and both Prothean and Reaper legacy. From the applications of Element Zero to the mass relays themselves, FTL technology is both a foundation and constraint of galactic civilization. So there you have it. Well, at least my layman's level breakdown of how FTL in Mass Effect works. The core idea being to establish a framework that works around both the problem of relativity and the immense power requirements to reach and surpass the speed of light. Element Zero and Mass Effect fields are of course a vaguely defined concept, but that's kind of what science fiction is all about. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and hit the bell notification icon to be informed of the next video. With this topic now thoroughly broken down, feel free to check out our full playlist on the ships of Mass Effect. Keyless alive, my friends, and until next time, I should go.